Backlash 2018 had a card that was underwhelming on paper, but had the potential to really surprise us. Did it end up doing so? Well, it's time to find out on this, a pay-per-view review special of Wrestling Rat. I first have to apologise for the lack of wrestling rant and poems and stuff last week, which was the result of a myriad of things. Builders renovating this house, which meant that I couldn't get recording done, because it's just too damn loud, I need quiet here. Then the power line and phone line were taken out in a thunderstorm, <laughs> which is Fantastic! You'd think, oh, my motivation would be up. Oh, hell no, because I had a depression episode which caused my motivation to tank, meaning my desire for this proved to be as good as the prospects of Brexit at this moment in time. You can see where I'm going with that. So as a result, it hasn't turned that well, but I'm here at the beginning of a new week feeling excited to get into video production and getting this channel up and running again. As we would. Now, honestly, that meant that I had to update the scores for Wrestling Rat. And Raw won, because Montreal is fantastic, meaning Raw is leading by 10 to 8. But that's not what you're here to hear about. You're here to hear about, oh, it's Backlash 2018 indeed, and I just slept at 4.30 in the morning watching this. And it wasn't the most entertaining of shows, despite of what my ratings would say. Anyway, we kicked off with a pre-show contest which had Ruby Riot defeat Bailey. Now the match was solid, but I feel like the crowd just weren't that into Bailey or the Riot Squad. And the fact they're getting a bit annoyed waiting for the inevitable between Sasha and the Queen of Huggers. Now, this is a problem for me because I feel like they've wasted so many chances to do it that they're just going in a Owens Jericho mode, hoping that when it does, we pop like mad. Yeah, but you wasted so many opportunities, it's getting a bit tired. But the match was okay, I just felt that it wasn't that interesting. That being said, they both looked good in the ring, and the heels won, which was against all logic, because I think it was the only prediction outside of one that I got wrong on the entire night. Yeah, I got two wrong on this night, so that should show that's a good thing. Predictability, though, can be a problem. But we go on to the first match of the evening, one that I'm looking forward to immensely, to tell you all about, because it was that damn good. As Seth Rollins defeated The Miz in a four and a quarter star contest to retain the Intercontinental Championship. Now, to say that the crowd were into this from bell to bell is a bloody understatement. They were hot as hell for Mr. Ronde Knight, Seth Rollins, and got into the Miz somewhat too. The fact is they made this match feel like it was a massive occasion and they fought for the belt like their lives bloody depended on it. Which is all you can bloody ask for from a match that had no real story implications going into it. I say that because there wasn't a lot going on. The intensity and aggression was there, but it was fueled into body psychology by working Seth's knee in everything they could get their hands on, prepping for the figure four, and then stopping Seth from doing finishes, and getting counted out of moves, and fluctuating momentum back and forth, which they were already doing, <laughs> and keeping the pace fast and consistent for the entirety of what, this near 20 minute contest? Jesus Christ, it was fantastic. Okay, there were a few niggles, I would have liked a few more slow areas in there, just to bounce it out a bit more. I would have liked more story emphasis, something to tie in, something like a Miztourage maybe, but they're not involved in this at all now. I maybe was even expecting Daniel Bryan to come over and screw Miz, because reasons, you know, just to add some extra fire to it. The psychology was good on its own but it needed more. That being said though, the rest of this match pretty much sold itself well to the point where I don't need to worry about its rating, but many of you would think a four and a quarter star rating for a match that was very, very good. The most entertaining thing on this card that got the crowd on their feet is a bit of a disappointment. It kind of is, but then again, this is how I review my matches. It was amazing, it just wasn't fantastic. It wasn't incredible. It wasn't five star quality and if they had those little extra bits it could have been but that's the thing I'm still happy the match was still brilliant and four and a quarter star is nothing to shake a stick at it's a good one I just needed a few more things and it could have been even better but I'm not going to complain although maybe I should because this was the best match on the night and that says a lot really doesn't it the whole rest of the card goes downhill from here 
but by how much? We're about to find out, aren't we? As Nia Jax defeated Alexa Bliss to retain the Raw Women's Championship in a result everyone saw coming, but the match was solid. It was good. It was okay. It was one and three quarter star worthy. I felt that overall that this match was a bit more balanced in comparison to the WrestleMania contest. I felt Alexa got way too much offense in that WrestleMania match to where it kind of neutered what it was trying to do. This time, however, it actually worked to its benefit, with Alexa working on the legs of, of Nia and really showing how aggressive her, her physicality has gotten to where it actually looked like it would impact. That DDT on the steps, oh my god. And the fact is, Nia fought back, and on top of that, Bliss fought out of the second rope Samoa drop because she knew it was coming. She knew that Nia would go for it, and it reversed things nicely. And overall, it was all about Bliss showing that, you know what? Are you a bully? Nah, I'm, I am actually the bully here, but I'm going to show I know you well enough to where you can't win as easily, despite the fact that it wasn't an easy win last time. Nia sold it well, she fought back, got a win, it looked pretty good, the pacing was somewhat stilted, but it had just enough time to make it somewhat worth it, and it was a little enjoyable despite the fact the crowd were tired out as hell from the match that preceded it, meaning it lacked impact. Overall, at the same time though, it was a decent contest, I found it somewhat enjoyable, and I can't complain. The segment afterwards, however, piloting the Be A Star campaign, was not. Naya, you're a lovely person, I am assured of that by people who know you and what you post on the internet, on social media, you are apparently a fantastic person, and I'm not going to doubt you for that. It's just that you're a bit too invested in these segments to where they don't come across as legitimate, they come across as corny and very, very cringy. Then again, this is what WWE wants to do, this is the character you have, and it works. Your theme song works, because you're not like most girls, and that's what it technically proves. But at the same time, I just feel the emphasis on this, oh, ev I'm an inspiration, everyone should really be inspired by me, and it's like, that's great, but it works better if you're healed, because it comes off as condescending in a good way. Not this. But the match was still solid, you did your job, I can't really complain, but I can, because it wasn't really average, was it? Overall, that last bit kind of neutered what was a decent match up until that point. Let's move on to the next one, which is Jeff Hardy defeating Randy Orton to retain the US Championship. Now, considering these two, I was fully expecting something fun. But instead, what we got was a phoned-in performance by the Viper and Jeff Hardy trying to pick up the bloody pieces as it got a three and a quarter star rating. Now, these two, much like Jeff would do against many opponents, um, ended up having a contrast in styles. One is hard-hitting, yet incredibly methodical, whilst the other is high-flying and quick. You'd usually expect something to work from that, but the fact of the matter is, while there was some decent pace and momentum shifting, which was balanced throughout, making both men look good, I feel that the match uh, wasn't really interesting. There was nothing to it, the psychology was null and void, the crowd weren't that interested at all, they were chanting Rusev Day through portions of it, despite popping for Jeff Hardy's moveset and his victory, which is warranted. I feel that Jinder Mahal has the speed to be able to keep up with Jeff. He's younger than Mr. Orton, I think, and I, I actually prefer Jinder facing him here, because Orton, you kind of know where his moveset's going, you kind of know what he's building up to, there wasn't much of a reason, story-wise, for him to actually do anything, and it was a phone-in performance, I've already mentioned that already, and Jeff just did what he could to keep the excitement there, and it worked to some degree, but the match overall just was nothing. It got better than expected for a nothing match, it was nearly one star, but... That being said, it needed a lot more substance. And okay, there were some solid moves in there, and but it just looked like it wasn't really having much of a purpose, and I don't like matches that do that. Annoyingly, there are a few on this card that didn't have much of a purpose, but anyway, you get what I'm saying here. This match was disappointing in quite a lot of ways. I expected this to be a sleeper hit, knowing that I enjoyed their 2008 Rumble match. 10 years ago, good lord, but that one had venom behind it, that had story plowing it forward, and the expectation that Jeff could actually win the damn belt. This one, it just didn't work for me. That's just my opinion, I guess. As we move on, before we get to the next contest, to what was an absurd segment, Elias 
doing his usual shtick, or trying to before being interrupted by the New Day, before then being interrupted by Rusev Day, before then being interrupted by No Way Jose, <laughs> and Titus Worldwide and Brizango in the Congo line. Um, <laughs> oh my god. And you then had, um, Bobby Roode coming out and nailing Elias with the glorious DDT. And then all of them just having fun. It was one of the segments that if executed properly reminds you so much as to why you love wrestling. Because you can watch athleticism all you want. You can praise the skill in making the matches work on a story perspective, on a physicality perspective, on a receptive crowd perspective. You could do all that. But you could take a step back and just realize that wrestling is fun. And usually WWE tries these elements of comedy and it doesn't work. This was unbelievably enjoyable. I had a smile on my face because I was thinking, wait, WWE have just done some comedy and I'm laughing at it. Job done. And uh, yeah, I mean, it advanced Elias versus Rude a little, which is nice to see. I can be really happy with that. And it gave a spot on the card for people who weren't in matches on the night. If you're going to do a co-branded pay-per-view for every show going forward, you need to use the time wisely to basically get as many people on the show as possible in important segments. Well, I say important segments, this wasn't. But at the same time, it was useful. It was enjoyable. It was fun. I just wish I rated segments like I do matches, because this would have been getting a pretty high one. It served a purpose for story of a feud. It was mindless enjoyable hilarity, and, well, to put this in perspective, I enjoyed the appearance of No Way Jose, because I kind of tipped it over the top. I don't like No Way Jose, I find his music annoying as hell, but the fact of the matter is, in this segment, full of music and frivolity, it bloody worked. It was just so great, and, um, yeah, the rarity that they actually gave us a comedic side thing that worked, ah. Oh. I can't complain, but the one thing I can do is slightly complain about the following contest. Daniel Bryan defeating Big Cass, well, that was an okay match, and it was a th well, three, what am I talking about, a one and three quarter star match. Now, the fact is, this was so close to a two star rating, you could smell it. I feel overall the match was really decent for what it was, it was quite quick. Cass showed himself well with his limited but hard-hitting moveset, and Daniel Bryan out-wrestled him, proving that it doesn't matter how big you bloody are, he's going to put you down to size and make you tap. Which is understandable, because if you say, oh, Daniel Bryan's no big deal, I can walk to this easily, then you tap out like a bitch, and then completely decimate him afterwards, proves that the storyline was technically tr telling you that you were promoting porkies. Unfortunately, though, you made yourself look good afterwards, so I can't complain. The fact is, there was enough psychology and story for Brian going after the surgically repair knee, to cast Ryan Brian down slowly, and using that power to do the damn job that really got the crowd invested, quite a lot, I may add, and the pace was steady, but decent. I felt the match was, again, too short for its own good, and the finish kind of came out of nowhere, but it made the end segment worth it. I feel this match was missing a few little bits. It wasn't as enjoyable as I was expecting. I thought it was going to be another sleeper hit on this card. I felt that Cass would have shown himself a bit more. But then again, he has recently just come off a year-long absence from a leg injury. You're not going to push him too hard, are you? So knowing that, this match actually exceeded some expectations. I felt that it was okay. It could have been better, but I'm happy with what we got here from a limited cast and a getting back to normal Brian. I felt that they didn't want to push him too far either. So they kind of eh, neutered each other out, basically. I felt that overall it could have been a little better, but I'll take what I can from a match that probably would have been rubbish if Cass had dominated for two-thirds of it more so and had tons of rest holds before going into what he did at the end there. Overall... I should be happy, but I feel disappointed regardless. I'm not sure if that's a good thing. We then move on to Carmella versus Charlotte Flair, a match that was the worst on this evening. A quarter star match. Now, I could have been nice and given this half a star for the psychology of Carmella spoofing the woo and 
Charlotte just being aggressive to her, wanted to get revenge after all that she'd done, and the fact that Carmella just gave no fucks and highlighting constantly that, yeah, I'm the champ, shouting in Charlotte's face where tons of submission holds were provided to wear the submission specialist down, I may add was very nice, and the selling of the knee buckling to get the pin full was nice too. There were little pieces there. No Iconics, unfortunately. Carmella won clean, something you wouldn't expect from a character who is very, 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 very cowardly. I'm sorry, that doesn't make sense to me. And the fact the crowd were literally not in it at all is a bad thing. The, the length of the match was good-ish. The pace was stop-start and sluggish because it was mostly submissions and rest holds and Carmella shouting. I mean, it did something, just not enough for me to shout with any praise, really. The psychology was the best part, but there wasn't a lot of it, especially from Charlotte's side of things. I would have expected more. Carmella did most of it and came out looking better, but only on a character perspective, not for the actual in-ring quality. I would never expect Carmella to beat Charlotte in an actual contest. So the fact that it happened clean here, with no Iconics, no Becky Lynch turn, which would have been interesting, no nothing to really spice up a contest that didn't really go anywhere, it proves that overall, while the story building up to this was pretty decent, the contest didn't have a lot in it to really jettison it to higher areas. It ended up being the worst on the night because of it. And as a result, I have to say I'm disappointed that the women on SmackDown, once again, give me something that isn't that great. That being said, the build-up was nice. I just need the end product to work, because the matches are what are important, of course. Just my opinion, anyway. We move on now to what many people are considering another disappointment. AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura going to a no contest in a no DQ match. I can't believe it either. It's for the WWE Championship to remain around the Phenomenal One's waist. Now, to say that this was a bad match would do a disservice. It was two and three quarter stars worthy. Not as good as the greatest Raw Rumble match. And I haven't reviewed the WrestleMania one yet because time isn't on my side. <laughs> where inevitably I don't know where I can compare that to. But the fact is, the match was building to something pretty damn special. Oh yes, it was. We had all of the slow starts from both of them before descending into absolute violence, Shinsuke highlighting his ruthlessness with absolute reckless abandon, and it looked like he was going for every high impact move he can get to ensure it was done. The chair shot to the Kinshasa bouncing off and causing a bit of bleeding which is what we want from a match like this. And then, of course, the Low Blow City. Oh my god. Low Blow City, population four, because that's the testicles that got completely done in. The match was building, the crowd were building up anticipation, getting excited. The pace was frantic. It was crazy at times. And it went long enough to where I thought, you know what? Cap off an end section for the next five, ten minutes. You're going to have a four-star match on our hands. But just like the last contest a week or so ago, it just ended on the most confusing booking decision. Unless you're going to give us a 60 minute Iron Man match at Money in the Bank to cap all this off where these guys have no room to escape, where every single thing they do has impact on the match itself, what's the point? I know, it's a, I know once again, you're trying to not let these guys go full pelt to make a match that's so big great, but we're getting a little tired of it. You've given us underwhelming yet still decent matches between two guys who can do a lot more. And um, I'm not happy with this. The ending was just so ridiculous that I just thought, what the hell? Okay, it makes sense that the match wasn't on the main event, because that would have made everybody pissed off. But to have it still happen is not good. I don't like this. The crowd were not as into this as I was wanting, much like every match these guys have had, where they got into it after a while, but that was a major flaw, but that was what was stopping it from getting three stars. Think about that for a second. And there was no move variety, no risks involved, no differences in the norm from these two, I meaning it wouldn't have reached three stars even if it tried. But this is the thing, folks. The match was still God-ish. But that's not good enough when you have these two going on. And the booking decisions were even more ridiculous. 
I just want to see these two go full-blown pedal to the metal, throw all caution into the wind, and just give us the kind of hard-hitting, story-laden, ridiculous, incredible showcase of professional wrestling that we know these guys can do. AJ did it with John Cena. He's done it with so many others. Why the hell are you restricting with Shinsuke? A man he knows so well, it doesn't make any sense. We'll have to make do with it, though. Two and three quarter stars, I can't really say much more. I wanted more from this, it ended as disappointingly as it started, and it had enough ingredients to make itself work, but WWE, with their booking, stopped it from doing so. You stopped the Greatest Raw Rumble match right as it was doing, going somewhere, and you did the same here. It went on a little too long, as a result, I don't care, it was going somewhere. And back and forth momentum just aside, it was doing good, and you ruined it by doing something stupid like a bloody count out, not responding to the count of 10 in an ODQ match. Logic, you make up your own rules as you go along. And we move on to a match that I didn't like on top of that. Bobby Lashley and Braun Strowman defeating Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn in a half a star contest. Now, this match was not as exciting as I thought it was. The crowd weren't that into it outside of Strowman kicking ass. Lashley was playing most of this as cleanly as he could do. Owens and Zayn splintered from each other, surprisingly. I do don't understand what's going on here. I understand because Zayn and Strowman have history. He doesn't want to fight him. But if they split off from this, what the hell is the point? Why have you got Lashley and Strowman teaming? Why have you had seen them acting like heels here, trying to get hate off of Strowman? What? The booking decision here was ridiculously stupid, and the match went on way too long for what it was trying to do. Uh, I, I don't get it. I, don't, I know this was meant to be a punishment for Owens and Zayn by Angle, but it didn't feel like it. It didn't feel like it. It felt like an elongated exercise to try and get Strowman booed. It wasn't going to bloody happen, though, was it? I love the idea, potentially, if they do splinter off, that Zayn, a heel Zayn, can fight a face Kevin Owens. I would love to see that. If that's the only thing that comes out of this match, brilliant. But there really wasn't that much going into it. What happened with with Zayn and Owens was what little there was to actually give this match some substance. The crowd was somewhat into it briefly, and the pace was at least decent, but there was nothing else to go on. This match was a nothing match when it was announced, and it was not much better when it was put into practice. As a result, you have a match here that left the crowd contempting everything. They were contempting the entire night up to this point. I was yawning. I was not fully into it, because this kind of match proved its weight in quite literal garbage. It wasn't the worst thing on the night, it wasn't the worst thing overall, but half a star. Considering four people here who could usually make something better out of it, I'm not happy with that. But I wasn't happy even more so with the main event. Roman Reigns defeating Samoan Joe. The real Samoan Joe, even though he actually isn't Samoan. That's a joke I can run on for days. In a match that Despite being better than fans will give it credit for, like they always bloody do with Roman, it got one and a half star. Because remember what I always say, if the crowd don't care, why should I? Because that is a huge, impacting, mitigating factor into why this match could have been two plus stars but didn't get anywhere close. Here's the thing, the psychology was very good. I enjoyed that, to a degree anyway. Roman being battered from the bell, getting worn down on the neck by countless rest holds. It worked. It worked. I can't deny that. Working that neck and the throat continuously, making that aggression come through even more. And Roman fighting through, but then continuously being swatted down and put down again. That was good. Roman fighting back and no selling it wasn't. But his win was bound to happen. The way he did it, however, not so. I'm sorry, you don't just go from eyes rolling in the back of your head in a Kikina clutch to going, ah, get in the ropes immediately. You have to struggle a bit more, rock the guy around a bit, make it look like you're bloody fighting and struggling. That's how you get out of submission moves. I don't know what that um, protective vest has in it. It must have some magical pixie dust or something. Not sure where Tinkerbell's been going near you. You ain't Peter Pan, pal. You can't fly. That's been proven wrong countless times, but you get what I'm saying here. The fact is, Samoa Joe made that match what it was, but the pace 
the length of the match I'll give credit for. That was what I expected. The fact is that it went too long past 4 o'clock in the morning. I felt like it went way too long for its own good at the end of it. Because it went with rest holds that stopped the pace in its tracks for quite a huge portion. Meaning the length of the match that could have worked to its benefit was neutered. Incredibly. And that wasn't fun. The crowd weren't into it. The enjoyment factor that was just gone. And uh, the psychology did what it had to do. The storytelling of this match did what it needed. But everything else barely turned up. And it's one and a half star because it's, it's decent, but it's nothing amazing. And I'm not happy with that, people. It ended the night with me angry, saying, for the love of God, Roman Reigns, you need to look human, for God's sake. You are battered for two-thirds of this. You were put through a table. You were choked out. Don't go through the match looking like you were fresh as a bloody daisy. I had this same problem when you fought Rusev in hell in a bloody cell a few years back. The same thing applies. I'm usually a guy who can go, you know what, Roman can wrestle good matches. He can, as long as he gets offense that is meaningful and works its way into the match and the story at hand. It didn't. It was all Samoa Joe. He made that match great and Roman was just there to pick up the win. Which is not what a match should be. And this is the kind of contest I was okay with the cage match apart from the finish. I was okay-ish with the WrestleMania match apart from the crowd and actually the finish too. <laughs> but this match, the finish was bad, but the match didn't go the way it should have been. As I always say, just because a heel dominates doesn't mean that a face should come back superhuman and win. This stuff doesn't work in 2018. You need to show like they did with Miz and Rollins. Equality, balance, highlighting that both men are as good as each blood each other. That can't happen all the time. Look at Cass and Bryan. But at least they worked into the story to make it so it made sense. Not here. The I I like Roman. I like Roman. But this this kind of superhero posturing is what makes a lot of people like the crowd did go against them. And WWE muted the microphones without even trying to cover it up this time. I'm just pissed off because of the way Roman won. The match was pretty okay up until that point, but it's just the way that he won it really rubbed me the wrong way and made me leave this event not feeling the best. So when it comes to my final thoughts, what the hell is that going to look like? Well, let's find out because this show is probably going to surprise you what rating I give it. Some are claiming this to be the worst pay-per-view in recent memory. Well, Battleground 2017 and Elimination Chamber 2018 would like to have a word with you. That's just my opinion though. But there is a good reason behind that. Elimination Chamber 2018 I gave a 2 out of 10 to because it had a three and a half star match to kick off the evening and then everything else basically was rubbish. It went into low one star to zero territory basically. The whole card was unsalvageable after that opening contest and it just showcased it as such. And of course the women's match was what, a two star match? So you can see where I'm going there. That proved problematic. Here, there was a four and a quarter star match to really get the night going, a WWE Championship match that was not as good as expected, but still pretty good at two and three quarter star. And then you had most of the matches averaging out at one and a half to one and three quarter, nearly averaging on two stars for most of the night, apart from a couple of matches which went below one. That's fine by me. There's enough consistency there to wear a night of frustration, poor booking decisions, and crowd apathy looked a lot better on reflection than it had any right to when I actually stopped watching it. I felt at the time that this pay-per-view was going to rate really terribly, but looking at the matches, they did, most, in the most cases, the minimum required, despite the fact a lot of them didn't have a lot of story going into them, a lot of crowd heat, and they made the most of what they could, I guess, but that still isn't very positive. When one match outshines the rest of them to where the whole night becomes a sequence of annoying events, logically it's going to make the night feel a lot worse because you are frustrated in the moment. But looking back, the matches had purpose in what they were doing. They achieved what they had to, I guess, even though some of those decisions were horrible. I feel that this show did a lot better than many are giving it credit for. But it still doesn't shy away from the fact that it wasn't a very entertaining watch. I personally was very frustrated 
very annoyed, especially because it went half an hour over the time. Usually a pay-per-view doesn't overrun if it's not a big four show. In fact, this one did. It was half past four by the time the show ended for me. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Some people have to wake up for work in the morning and they will not appreciate that. The fact of the matter is, folks, the pay-per-view for a watching experience may not have been the best thing. But the match quality did just enough to stabilize the ship to where, on reflection and analysis, it's not terrible. It's not great either. It's not even average. It's not even below that to an extent. It was poor, but not as poor as you think it ever could be, at least in my opinion anyway. The night had just enough going on in it where I felt like it was worth going, especially that segment, which I don't even rate segments on these shows. The segment was fantastic. That boys up a little more as well, because the segment that could have been utterly contrite and pointless was worth the time, combined with, a t with two matches that were decent, and most of them doing what they had to do to get themselves by, even though it was disappointing in retrospect, it was still okay. And I can't really say much more. I've been saying okay so much about this night, it probably has lost meaning, but here's the thing. In my opinion, Backlash 2018 scores a total rounded figure of 3.25 out of 10. Now, if it wasn't for the four-star match, and the segment, and the WWE Championship match, we'd be looking, what, at a 2.5 out of 10 show? 2.25 even, at a stretch. But that's the thing. Sometimes some good things and consistency can come along and really stop a sinking ship from really harming itself even more. I felt the show did what it had to do, but inevitably, it was problematic on so many levels to where that rating seems too kind. But that's just what happens with me. Sometimes the casual watching experience doesn't match up with what I review and rate matches for. But that's fine. Sometimes it can happen. The Greatest Raw Rumble, while an extremely elongated show, put on enough good wrestling to where a halfway 5 out of 10 was warranted. This one did enough, but not on the same level. They weren't pushing it enough for me. And as a result, you get a poor reflection on a night that, on paper, should have shocked a lot more than it did. But that's what happens. I'm hoping Money in the Bank delivers more, because I want to see a pay-per-view with an average of mostly two-star matches going through it. Because again, if it gets 5 out of 10, I'm pleased. That's enough for me. This one was under the radar in some extent. There were some things that were really enjoyable, but a lot that just made you question what the blue hell was going on in the brains of WWE Creative. But I will say this. Well done to Tyson Kidd, TJ Wilson, for producing and booking the opening contest to be as great as it could be, despite some obvious flaws that stopped it from going anywhere near the place where many people are putting it. You deserve all the credit, as well as the two guys in the ring and the referee, for making that the major attraction here, overshadowing everyone else in their wake. That being said, I don't want to see WWE Championship be below a Roman Reigns match again. I think we're all in agreement on there, and I will end this review thusly. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. My review of Backlash 2018 is in the books and finished. What did you all think about this show? Put your comments down there below. I am looking forward to reading them. And of course, there will be wrestling rant this week because I'm going to make sure it bloody happens against all the world conspiring against me. And of course, pones and stuff will be coming up later on this week too. So if you do not want to miss any of that, click the subscribe button and remember to hit the notification bell to ensure you do not miss anything. And of course, a cheeky like wouldn't go amiss if you enjoyed it anyway. So with that in mind, Backlash... It's a solid effort, but you look much more ashamed than you had any right to. Let's hope that you can rebuild and make next year's better, because Backlash has kind of taken a downward spiral since it returned to the pay-per-view count. I'm hoping we see something different, but you never know. Don't worry, we? Stop making poor decisions and make your product entertaining and insightful for us at home. Because a pay-per-view like this wasn't abysmal, but it was so close, you can almost taste the fumes from poor pay-per-views past rearing their heads. Money in the Bank should be good. 
I hope it is. Let's kick on and see where the rest of the year can take us. I have been Freddie Thomas. You've been people watching. This has been a Wrestling Round pay-per-view review special for the CC Network. And I will see you all next time.